From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. We got the band back together, Kaushik. I know. It's been some time, but like, you know, the OG Fragmented cast team is back. <laughs> In all honesty, though, it feels good to have you back on because uh, as I was talking to you offline, it's it sometimes doing the episode solo. It, it's kind of a hard thing mm-hmm. because I want someone to bounce an idea off of or I want another viewpoint and I realize that there's nobody there in this empty room. And so I just need to keep rambling on. So it's great to have you back. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, my pleasure. If anything, that's basically why I want to jump on because I want to get like, yeah, I want to rant as well and hear your rant. Because there's nothing like two Android engineers ranting about Android. And speaking of which, you wanted to start ranting about some debugging stuff. So I said, I said hey, let's do it. And, uh, and so here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, I had like a couple of... This episode, we were hoping to just keep it short and like discuss some tips, uh, tricks, and like, you know, the way we do debugging and stuff. Uh, I want to throw like a few things. Mm-hmm. So the first one I want to do is... Uh, I wrote this... I uh, actually wrote two blog posts. But the one that I'm actually talking about is... I wrote this one on asserting last value in Rx Java yeah. and like test observers. And I wanted to like bring that up with you because I know you were at a conference too and you had like some testing stuff to talk about. Uh-huh. So I was uh, hoping that, yeah, maybe we could chat about that a little. Yeah. So what are you, what are you testing like with your, so you're testing Rx Java and like the last value that's coming out of the stream or something? Yeah, it's actually a very simple concept. is isn't anything crazy. So with Rx Java, when you test Rx Java, the test observer is like probably like the staple and it's like the most useful way of testing Rx Java these days. If you notice when you test Rx Java, typically in the past, you've always had to do like assert value at and specify the index value for the value, right? Mm-hmm. So say you have a stream and it emits 10 values. If you're testing a specific value in that stream, you have to say assert value at that index, uh, you know, at index four, and then you then what happens is in that call block, you'll be given the element that uh, or the value that you're testing. And then you check that the value is this, it, uh, it's equal to this, or like, you know, you you rip that value apart and try to do the testing. Typically with this architecture, this new architecture pattern, like the whole MVI, unidirectional state flow stuff that we talked about in previous episodes too, the way I do my tests, I only care about the last value. I never, because, you know, in the end, the view state is emitted. You might have intermediate loading states. You might have like all kinds of other states, starting states. Uh, I usually don't care about that. Like in my uh, tests, the test spec that I have, the thing that I care about is like do all these things, all these events. In the end, all I care about is, is that the view that the user is seeing, uh-huh. right? Like the final view state. Yep. Uh, if So there is an easy way to do this in Rx uh, with using test observers. You they give you the value count, which tells you like at any point of time how many values were em- emitted. Yep. So what people would typically do is you would say your uh, test observer dot assert value at provide the value count minus one because it's an index, so it's zero and uh, so it starts from zero, mm-hmm. and then you have the value, right? And all I did was I just added uh, a Kotlin extension function to just say assert last value, and I just do that internally, right? And I found that super useful now because now I can like my tests read much better. So it just says assert last value. So that's the tip. The interesting conversation I thought we could have was, what do you think about that? Because there is an argument to be made that, because I know some folks care a lot about the intermediate states, right? For example, say you had an event, you had two intermediate loading states, and then you had a final view state or like, you know, the final result. Uh, Do you care that the result was in the index three versus index two? You know, uh, do you care that you had two inter? Because sometimes you might. Uh-huh. Like if you have a twenty intermediate loading states, then you know something's wrong, and you want to test that, yep. right? Uh, how do you go go about when you? Because I know, like, you care a lot about testing too. So, how do you go about thinking? Do you say nope? The only thing that this test cares about is the last value, or you're like, no, I care about the intermediate testing states. The test uh, really depends on what I'm trying to test. Uh, for example, if I know that. I've kind of decoupled my screen and it's kind of using like Rx Java to kind of power the screen of, uh, think of like MVI, like I press a button, then this event gets Mm -hmm. fired and it goes into a stream and then I press another button and this happens and then I swipe and this happens. Um, 
when those certain things happen, I if I want to verify that they happen in the correct order, then I'm then I'll actually use you know like with the you know the the tester with a view uh, so mm-hmm, the test mm-hmm. observer with test observer I'll then kind of use that with block and then I'll test each individual value saying assert the value at one is this assert the value at two is this assert the value at three is this so I make sure that hey when these things happen they did happen in the order that I expected and not some weird random just in case some other method call was shoved in there an accident then all of a sudden it shows a weird mm-hmm. event in there it could cause a bug I'll do that but when I am actually worried about hey what's the final result on the screen. Uh, then mm-hmm. I'll actually use the uh, assert latest value, and we have a I have a very similar one that I use as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I just happen to use the uh, I pass in a you know a lambda, and instead of using the value count, uh, I'll actually pass in the actual value itself, and I'll say uh, lambda and inside of there. I'll say values dot last. I'll just use the last extension method to get the value. Ah, I see, I see, I see. So very almost almost exactly like yours. I actually have another one that I think is. If I could say that looks almost identical to the one that I'm seeing on your blog post here, so I follow mm-hmm. a lot of the same principles uh, as you do. It just makes I don't know, it just makes it a lot easier to use, especially when you can actually create the the extension functions to help with your testing. Yeah, Kotlin has been so helpful in like just cleaning up the APIs. You just have to be crazy that you don't go like you know you just sorry you just have to be careful that you don't go too crazy with <laughs> the APIs. Yeah, so you talked at a conference recently about testing. So what was that about? Yeah, so I just got back from Android Summit, which was uh, over, held by the folks over at Capital One. And I spoke on the second day. And my talk was um, entitled uh, Testing for Success in the Real World. And I had a controversial uh, viewpoint on what I feel that testing, what testing is valid and how much you should be weighting your tests and types of tests. and I think everyone's familiar Ooh. who's viewed uh, some Google I.O. talks by the uh, some very smart Googlers uh, and so forth, but they have what's known as the like, the testing pyramid, and at the top of the pyramid is end-to-end. It's a small fraction. In the middle, there's integration testing, and at the bottom, there's unit testing. Um, and what they basically are saying is, like, look, 70%, according to them, 70% of your tests should be unit, 20 should be integration, 10 should be end-to-end. Mm-hmm. I remember when I first saw that and read that, I kind of looked at it like with that weird like thinking face emoji, like how you just turn your head how I was like, <laughs> hmm, like, I don't know if I agree with this. And I thought and let that sit for quite a while and realized I don't agree with this because I had this conversation at another like uh, software as a service conference for like business owners um, mm-hmm. where I was at and I was talking to one other developer there and him and I were talking about tests and he goes, he goes, man, I love tests. He goes, but I'm not a huge fan of unit tests or integration tests. I was like, hey, I kind of feel that way too. And he goes, I feel the best tests are, uh, you know, end-to-end tests. He says, they, yes, they'll be more brittle, but they'll actually test what my end user is going to see. And I was like, that's the way I feel. And so that's what mm-hmm. this talk was kind of about, is like actually flipping that 70-20-10 uh, percentage um, and mm. trying to get folks to realize, like, instead of thinking about it percentages, if you have 100 tests, 70 of them are unit 20 or integration and 10 are end-to-end. Instead of thinking that way, regard of like testing, because here's the deal. As soon as Google says this is what you should do, everybody takes this as gospel and runs with it and <laughs> says, look, Google said we got to go do it, so we should do it. I've been doing this long enough with Google where they've told me not to round the icons on my apps. They have told me not to make splash screens. They have told me not to They've use told buttons. you not to use bottom tabs. <laughs> yeah, bottom tabs. No bottom sheets. Don't make you know anything look like a navigation bar. Don't use the back. There is no back button up on the top left of the screen. Everything I just said is implemented in Android now. So it's like you have to take it with a grain of salt. Like they're just kind of giving their opinion at that point in time. Um, use, mm. you know, creative thinking and analytical thinking to see if that's the right thing. And long story short, I felt that the 70-20-10 split was not, uh, wasn't something that I agreed with. And I thought, you know what, we need to change the way we think about this from percentages to weights, meaning that you sh- that we should think about how, what are the most important tests in our application uh, what validates the behavior in our application? Because I want to get people to, to move to like a 60-40 uh, type of approach, thinking like, well, ps- if you're going to weight everything, I would put the weight of my test. I value my espresso test way more than I value my my unit and integration tests. Um, and again, let's make a quick definition. Unit, unit tests, I have no outside influence. If I'm building a calculator app and I add two integers, there's no external dependencies to run that. That's a unit test. I can run that. 
However, if mm-hmm. I have an application that needs to talk to uh, class A, needs to talk to class B, and they have to use each other to, to do the job, that's a dependency. If I'm testing those testing one of those classes, that's an integration test because I'm having to integrate one or more components together. And an end-to-end test is, you know, has many other names like black box, et cetera. Uh, it just exercises the application as it is. Of course, you might mock out the API so it's hermetic and so forth. But I want to get folks to think about how and why those tests are more important because uh, as I've said before on the stage is that your users don't care that your unit tests don't pass. They don't care that your, excuse me, your users don't care that your unit tests pass or your integration tests pass and they really don't even care that your end-to-end tests pass. But which one validates the actual user behavior? Espresso tests. Um, that's mm-hmm. not going to be a, t- a popular opinion uh, that a lot of people are going to follow. Um, or like to because espresso tests are hard to build. They're slow to run uh, and they're, they can be very brittle if you're moving quickly. Um, so it's kind of like you have to find that happy medium of like, hey, w- does this per- test provide a lot of value? And in my talk, I give a simple example of like a login screen that simply loads a screen. We type into the username password field and we click the button and I can see a success message. That's all the test does. But what it validates is a whole humongous ton of things. It validates the app can start. It validates that we actually see the correct screen. It validates that my, both my input fields are working. It validates that the, the edit button or the login button, excuse me, the login button is enabled. Say, for example, maybe I had a weird text watcher on the username or email you know, component. And if it didn't validate correctly or someone had made a mistake in there, that test would immediately fail. And then if I click login, it then validates, of course, that the whole stack is working. So short little 10 line test, easily validates a ton of components from top to bottom. So again, not super popular um, or something that's going to be uh, seen as, you know, uh, I guess it would be seen as controversial. Contrarian. Yeah, yeah contrarian <laughs> to popular belief. Um, I don't want people to think I'm discounting unit tests or integration tests. Not at all. I still write those. I think they should be used definitely when you're doing, you know, your test driving a feature or you're fleshing out a feature because that's going to help you enforce good design principles. But I do think people should change the way they view their tests. Like, well, hey, I got 80% coverage of my unit and integration tests. Like, cool, but does your app actually work? Like, that's what your espresso tests are going to do. They validate that your app works. I actually, so the interesting thing is I, by and large, am like 90% with you there on that opinion. Um, it's interesting because it just made me think about something. Do So here's the thing, right? Like, and I think we maybe have, uh, I may have mentioned this before, but I think maybe it was DHH or someone like with the whole Rails and because Ruby and like Rails have had this history of being like super gung-ho about testing, right? And then there were like people who were like sub-second testing TDD and a lot of that stuff, the whole Rails uh, Rails and Ruby land spawned a lot of these discussions. And there was this question that was once posed. And the question was, in an ideal world, if your integration tests, right? So like, uh, not integrations, or your end-to-end tests. If your end-to-end tasks, uh, tests ran super fast, so under sub-second, would you still write unit tests or would you write end-to-end tests? And I feel that question help, always helps me answer like what I want, right? And I was like, I don't care about my unit tests, honestly. In the end, I care about my functionality being tested, which is, I think, what you're yeah. saying, right? Mm-hmm. And that's exact, and absolutely we're on the same page there. Like in the end, all that matters is I've built functionality in this app. Is it being tested? I don't care how you test it. I just want to make sure it doesn't break. If I have automated code that helps me assert that that doesn't fail, that's all I care about. Nothing else matters, right? Uh, and I think that's like the idea. So if if our espresso tests ran incredibly fast, so like sub second, if any espresso test you know, like from the point I hit my play button while I'm building an Android studio, if it took a second, I wouldn't bother with anything else, right? I would write like the test my views, do everything, snapshot testing. I would like go all the way there, right? Because in the end, that's really what I care. And it's like you said, it's the easiest way to test behavior. But the thing that like got me thinking as you were talking was, oh, do folks who have a because I don't see that as contrarian. I don't see that as controversial either, right? Because the whole point of us wanting to write more unit tests, and at least this was, I, well, I should preface that by saying this is at least why I thought, you know, the reason I thought most people don't want to write integration tests and espresso tests and instrumentation tests is because it takes longer to run those tests. It's purely a function of time, right? It isn't necessary, at least in my mind, the argument was not uh, a function of 
philosophical like separation of concerns or something right uh, at least like that's basically what i presumed uh, it the reason i did because i have been that uh, down that road and i did and i usually tend to try and write all my tests in the unit test plan but that's mostly because they're faster to run right the, and rather than unit testing i should say pure jvm testing because i don't need an emulator spun up in the end i always do have to have an espresso test and like this whole architecture pattern is a, one of the large driving forces is that right you can test business functionality with just uh pure jvm testing right on your view model uh those the reason i write a lot of those is only because it's faster not because i think it's better if i could just write espresso tests and they were easy enough i wouldn't bother with any of this right cuz then i mean that's like the glory like the land of glory right i can just write code however i want i have my tests like that just run as a harness and i keep running them so i don't have to worry about it uh so at least yeah so i i actually completely am with you in that conceptually i think yeah you're absolutely like 100% right i don't even think i i can't see the argument against it the only trouble is sometimes if your tests take forever to run it just really bogs productivity down and i've been personally hurt with that a lot which is why i usually tend to sway so i'm like 90% with you the only 10% is like sometimes it just gets really hard to only write espresso tests right it it does it's and that's kind of one of the things i talk about like especially if your application is using you know of course you have a network calls like you have to figure out a way to mm-hmm. mock that out are you going to use something like mock web server or wire mock or uh, something you've created your own what if your app uses uh, interacts with bluetooth like how do you scan for bluetooth devices like all these things like you have to kind of build in these contingencies uh, and so it is much harder it is much slower i totally agree with that and i like i said i still do write unit integration tests i don't discount them they have a lot of value which is the interesting thing cuz i know you're like huge on testing and unit testing right mm-hmm. so i was like oh this is interesting i want to like ask on what he was talking about cuz i did see some of your tweets and uh, and this goes for not just android like i do the same thing in when i develop rails applications or node or now even some react applications i'm I validate that the UI or if it's an API with node that, that the API is returning the data that I expect it to return, you know? Who's the consumer of that? That's what I want to think about and what what is being presented to the consumer if it's an API? Okay. Is the data signatures correctly? Is it a UI or are the data elements and UI elements displayed correctly? Uh and so forth. The interesting thing here is that I I I spoke to a Googler recently who were named nameless uh, to protect them, but Uh, I kind of compl- had talked about this and said, "Hey, well, what's the what's your opinion on uh testing in and Android?" and kind of told them, you know, my take on it mm-hmm. as I just explained. And they said that, you know, um uh, this is a Google has a lot of experience on the team and uh, on the Android team. And they said, "Well, here's the thing." He says, "Android was created at a time when we had to get to market really, really quickly." And mm. a lot of decisions had to be made back then in order for us to ship and if we didn't ship as fast as we had shipped none of us would be here giving presentations or having podcasts or doing any of this kind of stuff together very true so those are the unfortunate circumstances that we are of the kind of the cards that we are dealt at this time now we are trying to go back and fix those things however due to some of those decisions made previously it's very hard to do it and it's sometimes not the best way to do it but we are in the situation and it kind of is what it is thankfully we're here because if we had just did everything the perfect way from the beginning none of us would be here right now mm that's i mean i think that's like a very good point i also like the idea where cuz that's the story of all software right <laughs> you can you can complain about how things are now but if you didn't ship in time it doesn't matter right like you don't exist to complain <laughs> exactly you know and that's yeah. basically what i i took them what they were saying as hey we look we know that we we have problems we know this thing isn't perfect heck it could even be a, a pig with some lipstick on it whatever we understand that but we're doing our best that we can to fix it and i do appreciate that um even if it's you know sometimes you do get frustrated when your ide can't find your espresso test <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like oh bad module got to go fix it oh invalidate cache and restart no t- no <laughs> test found no test found in, in what test suite or something like that whatever that oh my god no error I know yeah about. yeah yeah oh yeah absolutely everyone has run through that yeah. <laughs> it's always like a ton of tongue in cheek joke you know <laughs> 
All right. So that was one thing I want to talk to you about. The other one is, so I recently talked to this, uh, I was chatting with this uh, develop, a developer and I noticed, because uh, we were like pair programming, mm-hmm. and I noticed in Android Studio, they were using the uh, uh, Dracula or Darkula theme. One, I always get it wrong. It was, so it looked almost the same. But and you know how I'm a, I'm very obsessive with colors and themes and fonts mm-hmm. and almost oh, to right. a point where like you think I'm a crazy person and I know it Don I know it <laughs> I'm well aware uh, of my condition yeah yes yes I am so I was pair programming with this person and I noticed that they did something different which just caught my eye and I loved it I'm gonna drop images of these in Slack so you can have a look at it and we'll make sure to post these in the show notes so folks know what I'm talking about but the the, the idea is. Any time there's an error, so like you know, in the theme, you can customize IntelliJ. Oh right? yeah, crazy. So anytime, yeah, yeah, to, to like crazy extents. So anytime there's an error, what ha- what I noticed this person, he's and he told me like this is the only th- like this is the first thing that they do in like their theme. They don't change anything else. Almost everything else is the same. But the thing that they change is when there's an error, they change the theme to basically just show a whole block of red. So. The way they do that is the foreground is set to white and the background is set to red. Like, you know, a very stark, staring, screaming in your face red. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm looking at the screenshots now. Like, wow, that is like very yeah. intense. Yeah. And like in these, I've intentionally done some crazy stuff with the code. So don't like when we post screenshots in the code, don't worry too much about the code. I just I just copy pasted stuff to just like get errors in a very specific way. So one of these screenshots you'll notice I have, uh, I made, uh, I just like had an error with my observable stream and that whole flat map row, only that row is marked in red. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I removed, just like for kicks, I removed like the closing parentheses on one of those flat maps. And then I want, cause that would just like mess the whole file. So I wanted to see how that would land up looking. Would it just like make the whole file go red? Cause then it's like not useful, but IntelliJ is obviously smart about some of these things, right? So the way they mark those errors are also really nice. And I found, so I switched to this because, you know, I'm obsessed with themes and like, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue, but I kind of love it. Like the more and more I did this, I noticed that when there's an error, it just quickly pops up. You go fix the error and then like you move on. In some ways, it almost aids me in writing my code faster and like, you know, much. It's, it just makes the development process easier. It's such a small, silly thing in the grand scheme of things. But I felt I really liked it. And I also changed my selection. So I have another screenshot here where it's like the selection is like all white uh, background. So it just immediately pops up, right? Because when you're selecting something, that's in your focus. And so then it just brings that even more. And if there's an error, then it also makes sure that pops up uh, right away. So you don't like miss that mm-hmm. uh, that easily. I don't know. What do you think about this? You think I'm crazy? No, I'm, try lo- it out? No, I'm totally trying this out. I'm looking at the screenshots now and... I really like that because, to be honest, like I can't tell you how many times uh, in a longer file. Well, I guess it wouldn't really help with a longer <laughs> file, but in general, uh, let's in a file if I have an error, if I don't see the red squiggly, or if I don't see it in the gutter, um, I may act, and this has happened many times. I'll accidentally commit it, push, you know, I'll push wait, it up, wait. and all of a sudden my my compilation feels like what's going on. I'm like, oh, oops, I you know I have a G. Wait like a random G character floating in my file because I thought I was in git status or whatever. <laughs> oh my God, that's happened. I know exactly what you're doing. You're like, you switch too fast to terminal and you're like git status yep. or something, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> and there's like a G or git inside of my file and I've committed it. I'm like, oh, jeez. I don't see it in the gutter, but I I will scroll through the file a lot of times like really quickly. I'm like, God, I don't see any errors. But if it was like this, I mean, it's literally, folks, a the entire four, 30 characters of, of code the background of it is is red. The foreground, the text is colored white. I mean, it's completely obvious. Like, whoa, there's something majorly wrong right here. So uh, I'm going to give this a shot and try this out because I think it would actually help me catch some of those weird, simple errors that I miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, if, if folks are curious, I'm going to like in this specific screenshot, I've tried the, uh, I, I switch primarily between two themes because I know folks are going to ask about this. I have like this own theme that I created. It's called San Jose. Uh, that's, and I, I can post links to that on GitHub. And this one, though, is the Night Owl theme, which oh, I know on Twitter it. we have talked about. Yeah. Uh, and you brought this up, I think. So this Night Owl does not use the material theme, and that's going to lead me into my next <laughs> tip. But basically, and I know we have talked about this, so maybe we can like bring it up for the benefit of our listeners. But I don't, I think like typically when you use Night Owl as advertised in the 
for IntelliJ, they also ask you to install the Material Design theme, right? Yeah, or the, Material sorry, UI. The, right? No. Yeah, Material UI. Yeah, that's the plugin. So it's not the color scheme, but it's like a whole theme where it re-customizes the icons and changes your IntelliJ to look different. Yeah, Material Theme UI is what it's called. Material Theme UI? Yeah. yeah. I do not do that. I don't do that because I do not want to touch IntelliJ or Android Studio. I want it to be as pristine as the team over at Google wants me to use it. So I'm not adding another layer that will slow my Android Studio down. So I would not do anything to like mess at that fundamental level. I changed the color scheme and fonts, obviously, because I mean, you know, I doubt that that's not probably going to slow it down mm-hmm. necessarily. Yep. But uh, I do not touch that. So I do. There is a version where you can import just the color uh, schemes and fonts. And if folks are interested, I know I'm going to be sending down that, so I can send that. Uh, so there's two versions. There's the Night Owl Basic, which is like the original one. And for folks who don't know, this was a theme that was built by, I, f- I forget her, her name, Sarah or something? Sarah Dressner. Uh, yeah, Sarah Dressner, yeah. Uh, and she built that for uh, VS, Code. VS Code. Yeah. Uh, and it's gorgeous. And like, you know, she's done a lot of research uh, to make sure that she uses just the right. It's like the kind of thing that you're like, you know, if someone just do the research and tell me what's the best thing that looks good for my eyes. And once you start using it, it is really pleasant to the eyes. You know, it just, it is very easy to use. So there's two versions. There's, there's Night Owl and there's Night Owl Carbon, which fits a little better with the IntelliJ uh, Darkula native scheme. So I use like one of those. I've actually changed it to also tweak some things that I feel work better for me, especially like from building, like uh, from working with Android features. Uh, this is also one that I changed recently, like with the whole background red mm-hmm. flashing, hot flash red screaming thing. So I'll, I'll share that with you as well. So I'm curious to see like what your thoughts are once you work on this. And yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Uh, if when you see the 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 theme. It's like Couch said, it's just the theme part. So it's going to change the editor view. It's not going to change the entire mm-hmm. Chrome of the window. Mm-hmm. Um, but Night Owl, by far, if you use v- VS Code, go install the Night Owl theme. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. There's a light and dark version. There's actually a couple variants inside of VS Code. It is by far my favorite theme I've ever used on any IDE ever. And I've tried the Material Theme UI. The problem is it turned my... It, totally borked my machine i I couldn't uninstall Uh, it Uh, i uninstalled it there was this weird remnants lying around i eventually deleted android studio from my my machine that didn't fix it i went through and deleted all of the android studio references i could find inside of my local directories and hidden directories of everything i knew about and i reinstalled a new copy still couldn't get rid of it still couldn't get android studio back to normal i talked to the i talked to the developer i did everything he said i should do I don't know what happened. Something got hung up and it didn't go away until I got a new computer. So I haven't, <laughs> I haven't touched. You're like, I need to buy a new machine because my Android Studio got barked. <laughs> well, yeah, thankfully, my client had you know, replaced the computer and um, I never installed this on my local machine and, or my own personal. And since that point, I'm like, I, I won't touch Material Theme UI again. Maybe things have changed, mm-hmm. but that was probably six, eight months ago where I had that problem. Um, but I'll definitely check out the Night Owl theme for that. Um, and I'm definitely interested in, in seeing how that kind of red squiggly is going to help change my my work mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and like along the same lines, the last tip that I want to talk to you about. So I also wrote a blog post uh, early this morning about speeding up your Android Studio. So <laughs> the story is uh, I've, I use a MacBook Pro 13-inch a lot these days mostly because sometimes I bike to work and I find myself moving a lot. I'm not stationary at my desk. So because of that, you know, I got to use a 13 inch. It's just so much more portable, the MacBook Pro. But man, Android Studio was deathly slow. Like it was so hard for me to like actually work and get an emulator up and run Android Studio. It would be slow. I would edit XML. It would take forever. And I know that's a bug that they fixed also with Android Studio recently. But even just like going through code, jumping through files, I would actually find Android Studio be slow and it was frustrating. Uh, so over time, what I did is, I mean, I couldn't live life like that because I also had to like build features and write code, right? So I actually tweaked Android Studio and over time I've been collecting a lot of tips and this blog post basically has, uh, I mean, I've seen a whole bunch of things, but I think in the end, this is what I've like trimmed down and I think these are the ones that worked. And I've I, I posted it. Uh, yeah, the, you can have a look at it. But one of the things that I think were interesting along those lines that we talked about is 
uh, you got to disable any of those plugins that you don't use in IntelliJ. And there are a whole there's bunch a ton, of them. There's man. Yeah, yeah. There's so many of them. So Do you use Mercurial? The, no, uh, disable I, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mercurial. You, what are you that? building a, an Android <laughs> game? No, disable it. <laughs> exactly. And they have like a lot of like streaming stuff yeah. and all kinds of funky things that I probably think are like good. So what I did is in this blog post, I... Because you can't disable everything. You would think some things you don't need, like internationalization for Java, IntelliJ, uh, IntelliLang, the Java bytecode decompiler, Android NDK support. You would say, oh, my app doesn't use NDK. I don't need it. Uncheck. Uh, nope. <laughs> I unchecked it, and it hosed Android Studio for me. So you can't go too crazy. Um, Repeat again. But, which one hosed it again, just so we have that... that- the Android NDK support, you can't disable that. So what I did is in the blog post, I only put the list of ones that I enabled. And I think most people would want this. Uh, you can remove the Git ones too if you don't use Git inside IntelliJ. I do like the diffing in IntelliJ. I love that feature. So I actually kept my Git integration on. But other than like, so like the, I, I and I also use Vim a lot. So like the idea of Vim plugin is the one I have. APK support, NDK support, Gradle, Groovy, internationalization, the IL8N for Java, IntelliJ configuration script, IntelliLang, Java bytecode decompiler, JUnit, Kotlin property support, Smalley support, again, something you need for the Android to, for Android to work, and the YAML support, because, you know, when you edit XML stuff, those are the only ones you need. Uh, everything else, go ahead and disable that shit. You know, it's just, <laughs> it, it, it makes a big difference. Uh, which is why like the whole like mercurial uh, not mercurial sorry the material ui theme all of that i was like nope gonna get rid of all of that stuff you know markdown support uh nope i don't need that i will just use the regular editor for that right and this one is a huge one once you disable these plugins and use android studio it actually is super usable it's like faster in general uh so that's one that that's one of the tips the other one is uh using a local gradle distribution Actually, uh, I have this in the blog post. I might change it, though, because uh, Zavi from the Android Studio team, he leads Android Studio, wonderful person you should follow him on Twitter, a great person to also talk with in person. He tweeted back and said, hey, the greater local distribution thing, I don't know if I would recommend that. He still recommends having them both be the same, use the Gradle wrapper. And again, this is the kind of thing you want to do only if you need to. I need it to, because for some reason, it made a huge difference for me. So basically, I install Gradle on command line independently outside of everything. And then I make Android Studio point to that Gradle. I also do that for Java. And I think that one, I think, does like have it does make a difference because you want to make sure you're using the same Java across Android Studio and your command line because otherwise the Gradle daemon's done compatible. So even though you use the same version of Gradle, they won't share anything. So that's also like a subtle point that not too many folks like realize uh, and what was the other one oh yeah and then there's this studio.vm options file so yeah. i put all of that in the blog post uh, there's a lot of stuff in your vm options here too which is you know interesting which i mean we could actually have a whole episode just on like <laughs> which know, we might have to do know. one day of optimizing this but yeah if you're having problems with android studio um you want to make sure that you're setting was it the xm x yeah the properly ac- yeah yeah, so basically that's another tip that they mentioned. Uh, so the Studio VM options that I have, the top part is I think default, like with the latest Android Studio, a lot of that should be the same. The custom settings are all down. And I actually took it uh, from like Artem's GitHub repo because I think he has a repo that talks about it. And there's just three, uh, four settings. The XMS is basically the initial size of the heap. By default, it's just 256 MB. Typically, most machines now are more like my MacBook Pro definitely has more memory than that. So I bumped it up to a gig. So I put XMS 1 GB and the max size of the memory allocation pool, they default that to just uh, 1.2 gigs. So I bumped that to 2 gigs. Yeah, careful. Don't go, XMX. don't go too high on that like I did. One time I turned it to like 8 gigs and then everything started swapping like all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other trouble with these things. You're right. You can't go too crazy, right? Yeah, and it's... Um, as you know, if you start swapping all over the place, then everything's slow. <laughs> so swapping, I haven't heard that. Like the disk swapping and stuff. Like you remember in the Windows days, you used to have like virtual directories for like disk space swapping and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I start. It's happy. funny you bring up Windows. I was talking to uh, Eric Hellman uh, on oh, yeah. Twitter, 
and he had mentioned something about like computers about how um i think or he had quoted something saying like it looks like you know chromebooks don't last that long and windows don't you know also doesn't you know last a little bit longer uh, and then but macbooks yeah, seem yeah. to last longer because of, of uh, the build quality and so forth so i totally agree with this you know because back when i used to be a windows guy i would I felt like I needed a new computer, a new laptop every two years. Now I'm on a MacBook Pro that's almost five years old, and it's still like a screaming demon. Oh, nice! Yeah. Oh, I, I know a lot of folks talk about like Windows, Chromebooks, using like you know different machines. I love my MacBook Pro, man. I just don't intend to use anything else. Obviously, I know it it is expensive, so like not everyone necessarily is at a, a position to afford a MacBook. At you know for their work environments, but if you can, oh geez, it's I would not like move to anything else. Previous guest on the show, Mike Nakamovich, uh, another Android GDE, he oh, yeah. actually runs, if I remember this correctly, he runs a Linux laptop uh, and does all Android development on there. And I heard actually a couple of folks uh, that did that with Android as well, and they said that their performance was even better over on Linux. So um, I know, like as you said. MacBooks are very expensive. Um, you can still develop with Windows. That's not a problem. We're not saying don't do that. But if you are, you know, thinking about something, you might want to take a look at perhaps a Linux distribution and running Android Studio over there, uh, and you can still get to use all of your kind of Unix-based tools as well. Yeah, and also uh, the other Android Studio uh, lead and much loved in the community, Tor Tor Norby. I know he at Google I.O. this time he meant because uh, everyone asked him, he's actually switched completely to a Linux machine as well. He did say if I think and he has a tweet about this, too. He's like, if you can get someone to handle the drivers for you and because he works at Google, obviously, they handle like a lot of this stuff. He's like, if you can handle that part, then it's like super useful to work on a Linux machine. And he's actually been working actively on I think he, his primary machine now is a Linux machine. So he also did talk about this uh so, yeah, if folks are interested, you know, there's a Linux machine out there for you. The uh, only problem I have with, like, Linux is, like, choosing a distribution, you know, like... Oh, yeah, the distros, yeah, it's yeah, It's like yeah. Ubuntu always seems to be, like, the default, but then if you, like, go Google, like, uh, best Linux distro 2019, you'll get various different sites saying, oh, you should use CentOS, you should use, you know, Mint, you should use 12 different other ones, and it's always, like, a challenge to figure out which one works for you, so... You have to do your research. Which ones have, you, have you tried any of these in the past? I have not tried any in, in, in a number of years. The last one I really used was, was Ubuntu. But I mean, again, I was talking to someone from a different person from Google recently, and they'll remain nameless as well. Um, but they said that at their death at Google, they run a Linux machine with two, I, uh, we had to check them on this, but uh, to 256 gigs of RAM on the desktop machine. What the? <laughs> <laughs> so everyone was like, did you say that you're right? sure that wasn't like... <laughs> no, that's, space, right? that's legit. That's, uh, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I've never heard of such a thing. And so that was kind of mind-boggling. But they did say that the performance on it was just unparalleled because of so much memory. Mm, makes sense, yeah. I've, in the past, uh, in the early days of my Linux, in my early Linux days, I've used Red Hat. But then Red Hat, at the time, at least in my career, it was just too much for me. I couldn't like... I was just too difficult... So then I think I switched to Ubuntu at that point. I think maybe a year or two back, I was like trying out Scent OS just because I've heard so many good things about it. But yeah, it eventually, for my, like, I just come back to the Mac because it's like, I want my life to be easy. You know, I don't want to deal with the driver stuff. I don't have a big team of people helping me with my drivers. So I just, yeah, the MacBook is just the easiest for developer machines, at least in my opinion. Yeah, you got to know your limits. You got to know what you're willing to put up with. And I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I'll, I'll pay a premium so I don't have to deal with all the other stuff. Um, all right, that's the, that's the stuff that I had to like, you know, pick your brains on today. Anything else you want to share to the folks before we sign off? No, not at this time. Just uh, again, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, I was at Android Summit, again, like I mentioned, had a lot of listeners come up and say hi. Um, we really appreciate when you folks come up and say hi and and, and let us know that you listen to the show. Kaushik and I a lot of times are, are in a room by ourselves talking into a microphone. We have no idea who's out there listening. So when you do come say hi, you see us at a conference, we really do appreciate it. Thank you for listening, lending us your ears over all these years. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Beautifully said. I, Yeah, I couldn't say it better. <laughs> All right, folks, thank you so much for listening and we will catch you in the next episode. 
That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.